it's late on Friday and everybody's tired, and so I figure I'm going to talk about documentation and put you all to sleep for real. <laughs> but um, I'm going to make a point that this stuff matters, and it matters for an awful lot of reasons, right? Documentation, of course, is a crucial aid to our users. It tells them how they can actually use the kernel that we were working on all this time. It's equally important, if not more important, for our developers who are wondering how to deal with this massive body of code that we have. Remember that with every kernel release that we do, we have generally about 250 first-time contributors coming in for each release. That's a lot of people coming into the kernel community. And they need to learn how to, to do this somehow, how to work with this. And how do they do that? They do it either by screwing up on the mailing list or hopefully by reading the documentation and avoiding that. And equally important, documenting things helps us to think about what it is that we're doing. Some of my very earliest kernel patches back in the, the late 1990s came about as part of writing the driver book. And I looked at how certain interfaces worked and I said, do I want to document that? And um, decided it was better to fix the problems than, than to write down how badly certain things worked. Um, anybody who's spent a lot of time documenting things has had a similar experience. It's often, but it makes you realize that certain things shouldn't be the way they are. So all of these things, along with in general, just making things more inclusive for people in general, means the documentation is a crucial part of building a healthy community. So we need it. So a little background, the kernel. The kernel is big. You all know this. I don't need to go through this. But you know, we have something like 1,700 developers contributing each release every 10 weeks, about 4,000 a year. About 13,000 change sets over the course of the year. So the kernel is indeed a big and fast-moving project. This is not going to be news to any of you. Some things that are news to some people that I like to point out. It's generally not news that 90%, roughly, I think actually a little more, of the code going into the kernel is put there by people who are doing it as part of their job. Right? The, the picture that we used to see of kernel developers working in their parents' basement is, is not, not the real picture. Right? People are doing this as part of their job. Try to find somebody whose job it is to write kernel documentation. Right? There, there's nobody whose job that is. There are certainly people who do that as part of their job, but it's something that they do on the side because somebody told them they have to, whatever. We don't have a paid documentation person anywhere in the kernel community. Any free software community has various sorts of ghetto areas that don't get a lot of attention. This is, this is one of them. Um, there are many others. The kernel, as a whole, has a very well-defined maintainer model. Right? We've got this nice hierarchy. We've got developers contributing patches to maintainers who put them in a repository, perhaps ship them up to higher level maintainers, and the stuff eventually gets to Linus, where he decides what to do with it. Right? Nice, clear hierarchical model. And in fact, if you look at the, the way commits actually flow into the, the kernel, you can see this. Right? This is just each box is a, is a repository. So we got flow into Dave Miller's net and net next repositories, and then collecting up about 2,200 patches going into the, into the main line to Linus this time around. And again, you see this nice hierarchical structure of things flowing upstream. And the structure matches nicely the, the directory structure of the kernel itself. So if you're the SCSI maintainer, your purview is driver slash SCSI and everything that's below it. Maintainers generally have a nice little neat subdirectory that they, they take care of. Well, we have a, a documentation directory in the kernel, but nonetheless, documentation does not fit this model in any sort of way for a couple of reasons. One is that everybody messes around in the documentation directory. Right? This isn't my domain, and I get to decide what goes in there. If you look, there'll probably be several dozen trees that, that touch documentation in any given merge window. And if you think about it, it has to be that way. You can't change this. Because if somebody is making changes to the code, and they're thinking far enough ahead to actually change the documentation to go with it, that, those changes have to go in together. To tell them, OK, you have to split them and run the documentation through the documentation maintainer would add friction to a system that's already not running as well as we would like. Um, it would be a bad idea. We can't do that. So this is going to continue, but this leads to an awful lot of questions of who is supposed to apply this particular documentation patch. And it leads to a lot of merge conflicts that I get to explain to Linus every time around, and so on. It's just life. And then a lot of documentation, as you will see, actually doesn't live in the documentation directory. It's spread all through our source code. And so that, again, leads to a lot of sort of jurisdictional questions about who should be dealing things where. Right, kernel developers were you know, a big, bleeding-edge project, but very fairly conservative people. They don't like change. 
and again, for good reasons. So if you come in and you say, okay, I'm gonna change up how documentation is done, you're gonna run into resistance. And, and I have found this in, in a number of ways. It all adds up to um, just, just maintaining all this stuff is an interesting challenge, perhaps like being any other kernel maintainer, but it has its own unique challenges. So when I first came into this a few years back, the, the state of our documentation was more or less like this. If you looked in the documentation directory, there were about 2,000 text files there. So you couldn't say we didn't have documentation. We had 2,000 files full of, of documentation there. Uh, they were all separate little bits of text, but they were something. And we had 32 template files that are called written in the docbook language, which anybody who's dealt with docbook knows just how much fun that is. And um, those template files worked with thousands of kernel doc comments in, in the kernel source to, to knit it all together and create a set of formatted docs. For those who haven't seen kernel doc comments, they, they just look like this. There's a slash double star that says this is a kernel doc comment. Got the name of a function, the parameters, the description of what the function does. They get more complex than this, but this is really the, the whole idea behind kernel doc comments. These are located in the source code, throughout the source code. Last time we looked, there were about 50,000 of these in, in the kernel source. So we've got a lot of them. So we, we had all of this stuff back in 2016 and say, okay, this is great. What's not to like there? Well, the first thing to do is to, to imagine for a moment. Kernel developers are, are talented people. They, they can do an awful lot of great things. But user space development is not always at the top of their list of skills. And if you say, okay, let's take a bunch of kernel developers who aren't actually really interested in the problem and have them build their own document processing and formatting system with a bunch of duct tape and bailing wire and components they found lying around on the net somewhere and think about what you would get. Um, we got it. Uh, we got it um, perhaps even worse than you might think. The, the build system we had for docs was a nightmare. At one kernel summit, I asked the the assembled crowd there, kernel developers, how many of them had successfully built the docs? And it was about 30% of the people who raised their hands. Most people tried it and just gave up. You really just, you couldn't do it, it was painful. We had kernel doc comments, but you couldn't do any kind of formatting in them. They were just a stream of words. And we had people who were wanting to do more sophisticated things in the in-source documentation. And we're finding this really limiting. We could do formatted output from the template files, not from those 2,000 text files, but it was pretty ugly. And um, in the end, the rest of it was 2,000 standalone pieces of text. Rob Landley, the, the doc maintainer a while back, said that it was made up of stuff that random passers-by just sort of put somewhere and left there, and that was what we had, and it really was. None of those 2,000 pieces of documentation was written with any of the others in mind. There were no references between them. We didn't have a kernel manual. We had 2,000 independent little bits of text that described what somebody wanted to, to describe. So it was kind of painful for everybody involved. So I was talking to various people wanting to do a better job with kernel documentation. And we started to think about what we might want to do if we wanted to improve this. So we wanted to come up with a new kernel documentation system that first and foremost would preserve the readability of plain text files because kernel developers deal in plain text and text editors. If you tell them they have to go to a wiki to write documentation, they're gonna tell you where you have to go. Um, <laughs> seriously, right? <laughs> um, you know, or if you tell them they have to do it in LibreOffice, they're, they're not gonna go for this, right? That's not how we work in the kernel community. But we still wanted nice, um, you know, better formatting and, and text integration features, um, even if it was done with plain text, so that we could create an integrated set of kernel documents instead of these 2,000 chunks. And of course, in the end, to encourage the creation of more and better documentation in general. So in 4.8, we adopted a new system called Sphinx. Sphinx was written originally by the, by the Python community to document the Python subsystem and, and code written in Python. So it's a system that was designed to document code. So it has a lot of nice features oriented around that. Um, one of the very nicest features of it, of course, is it's maintained by somebody else, which uh, we like a lot. And it allows the formatting of documentation in a, in a format called restructured text. For anybody who hasn't seen restructured text, it's just another plain text markup language. So this is a plain text or a restructured text 
bit of restructured text from the kernel documentation. So that's how you get a subsection heading. That's how you create a bulleted list and so on. Just the usual sort of plain text formatting. Nothing really special there. So it's obviously quite readable as a plain text document, but it also formats up nicely if you turn it into a web page or a PDF or whatever. So we did that. We also added the ability to put restructured text in the kernel doc comments so that people could do more sophisticated things with the documentation at that level as well. And then we tossed the doc book stuff a release or two later, and there was much rejoicing. So that's kind of what we did. And where has that left us at this point? If you look in the documentation directory now, as of um, 5.4 pre-RC1, there are now um, just over 3,000 files there. So given we had 2,300 when we started, we've at least created more documentation somehow. So that's something. Um, these files now, 2,100 of them are in restructured text. It's been a, a long, steady process to get there. If you look, when we first added Sphinx, we had a, a burst of conversions over restructured text, and then it went on kind of steadily until Mauro got fed up. <laughs> and then um, he submitted a, oops, submitted a whole bunch of patches. To do that, we crossed over in 5.3, and now the bulk of our documentation is in the restructured text format, which is good. We have a vast and growing collection of kernel doc comments. And um, this is the same slide I went up before. If you think about this particular kernel doc comment, and then you run the documentation build, and you look on the web, like what you would find on kernel.org now, that kernel doc comment turns into this, where you've got the function prototype, description of what it does, the parameters, and so on. Pretty basic formatting of, of that sort of stuff. And this is all done automatically as part of the, the kernel documentation build. If you look at this kernel doc comment, this is a, a documentation block. It's not associated with a specific function. It is free documentation that the DMA buff author put into this file. And you can see now it's in restructured text. It has an enumerated list in it, that sort of thing, right? So this is in the source code, right? It's not in a restructured text file somewhere. But in a restructured text file, you put in a directive that looks like this. Kernel doc is a Sphinx extension that, that we wrote. Um, that Yanni Nikilo wrote in particular, to extract this, this particular block from this file and pull it into our restructured text documentation. And at the other end, that same comment comes out looking like this, where again, you've got the subsection heading, you've got your nice enumerated list, and you see other things like the, the function references here have been turned into hyperlinks. You click on one, it takes you to the documentation for that function, so you can see how to call it, how to use it. We are, in other words, very quickly catching up with the late 1990s, yeah. <laughs> which, is, which is progress. This is much better than what we had before. This is the kind of stuff that we wanted to have so that we could actually tie our documentation together. Um, we get a nice index out of there, a function index. You can go into the index and look up any function you want and, again, get to its documentation. We've got various other things. We can create PDF output, which we had before in some form, and EPUB. So if you want to read the kernel documentation on your ebook reader, um, you can do that. The incremental builds now are really fast. If you do a full documentation build, it is um, not so fast. But um, if you change one or two restructured text files, you do a make HTML docs or whatever, it's quite quick. And that is nice. That's a big step in the right direction. Um, Mauro wrote a script called Sphinx Preinstall. Because even though we have simplified the tool chain a lot, there's still stuff you have to install. And if you want to generate PDF output, then you have to drag in the whole LaTeX tool chain. And there's a lot of stuff you have to install. So rather than make everybody figure out how to do this, he wrote this script that looks at what distribution you're running, looks at what, you're, what packages you have installed, and tells you what else you need, and sets it all up for you, makes a nice little Python virtual environment. So you just run the script, and you can build the documentation. And you really don't have to mess with the rest of it. It's gotten much easier than it used to be. So we've come a long way, and this is a, a good thing. But um, we're not done. So the main thing that I want to talk about here really is, what's next? What are we, where are we going to go from here? So just yesterday, I ran across this little bit of wisdom from our fearless leader, saying that if you have expected warnings, you're going to ignore the new ones. Right? So the only acceptable situation is no warnings. Well, if you um, build the kernel docs, you will get um, many, many, many of these. Right? Each one of these corresponds to you know, either just a restructured text error, or usually what these warnings correspond to 
is a kernel doc comment that does not actually match the function or the data structure that it's said to be documenting. Our tooling actually checks these things. So if you put in a kernel doc comment with a particular function and set of arguments, and the actual function differs from that, then it will issue a warning like this. So we have a lot of these. The, um, part of the reasoning with putting these comments in the kernel source is so that one, you could find them if you're looking at the function, you can also see its documentation. But the other was the idea that developers, when they're changing a particular function, will see the kernel doc comment right there and they will change it to match. This is an optimistic view of how kernel developers work. <laughs> All right, so every time somebody doesn't do this, you get a warning like this. And then you build the kernel doc and that warning disappears amongst hundreds of others and nobody notices it. So, one of the things I really want to do is to eliminate all of these warnings. Because if you can get them to zero, you can try to keep it there. But until you do, people are going to add them left and right. So I try to get people to work on this. It's, it's kind of a pain to track down each one of these and figure out where things went wrong and what the right fix is. But it's, it's not all that hard. And anybody who's looking to help, if you want to help get rid of build warnings, that would be a wonderful thing to do. All right, converting our remaining text files, this is something that's in progress. As you can see, we're almost there, but there's still about a thousand files under documentation that haven't been converted to restructured text. This is an easy job, generally. Most of our documentation was already 95% restructured text to begin with, because it's all pretty straightforward. But um, there are various reasons why some of this stuff hasn't been done. I will return to some of those um, shortly. But as you're thinking about converting things and all that, there's, there are other problems that come up. One of them is this idea of, of ancient documents. In an ideal world, everything we had in the kernel would be nice and current and reflecting the current state of reality. Um, in the actual world, we have something else. So I recently got a patch converting this particular file to restructured text. So again, it's almost there already. It just needs a couple of tweaks. But this is the entire file, okay? This was added something over 10 years ago when some, somebody wrote this driver, presumably, and said, okay, I'll drop down quickly which hardware I supported and make a file and throw it into the documentation directory. It was, in fact, the only file in this documentation plat platform directory. Um, it might have been useful to somebody when it was written. Uh, assuming anybody is still running this hardware at all, and assuming somebody's still maintaining this driver at all, the set of supported hardware has certainly changed, right? So this isn't going to reflect current reality in any way. So when somebody comes along and says, okay, I'm gonna make this into restructured text, I can only say thank you, but this actually doesn't help us very much. And in this case, I suggested that what we should really do is just delete the file. So that was what was done. So I'm much happier when I get patches like this one. Okay, back in 2004, uh, we deleted support for certain ARM um, machine platforms, right? But left the documentation files behind. So for 15 years, we have carried this documentation in the kernel that, that does not actually reflect anything that the kernel has in the source code. Okay, so we've been dragging the stuff around since before the Git era even began, which is nice. For an extra little bonus, Somebody converted them to restructured text. <laughs> Which again, isn't very helpful. So, so Jonathan discovered this and looked at it and, and simply deleted them. I love patches like this. But they, ref they show a real problem that we have. The documentation subdirectory is full of this kind of stuff, right? Stuff that people put there 10 years or so ago or more and have forgotten about and no one else has gone to since and if you're somebody trying to figure something out about the kernel, and you go into the documentation tree and you find stuff like this, well, you, you get this impression of a very dusty and cobwebby sort of place. It doesn't give you much confidence for the state of our documentation in general. And if you walk away with, with a poor impression of our documentation, you're right, right. We shouldn't have this kind of stuff in there. But we do, and it's going to be a, a real struggle to get rid of it. Because you know, what I found is converting documents to restructured text is easy. You can usually do it in about five minutes. But actually looking at the documentation, evaluating it, seeing if it's relevant, seeing if it's correct, seeing if it's current, 
and perhaps updating the documentation to match reality. This is a rather harder task. And finding volunteers to do that is much harder. So I will take patches from people fixing typos or, or converting to restructured text. I'm happy to get those. But I'd really much rather see people who dig in a little bit deeper and try to actually make our documentation better rather than just looking better someday. So another area, this is an area where I run into disagreements with, with developers at times and where I'm not really sure where we want to go entirely myself, but I think this is important. All right? Documentation isn't for the kernel developers who write it, typically. Sometimes they're writing notes to themselves, sometimes it really looks like that's what they had in mind. But in general, you're writing documentation for somebody who is going to come along and read it and somehow benefit from it in dealing with, with the kernel source. So if this is your point of view, if you want to do something that benefits the reader, you have to ask, who are our readers, right? Who is reading this stuff? And there are quite a few groups that you can come up with right offhand, starting with kernel developers. Much of our documentation is aimed at kernel developers themselves. And you can really even subdivide that into established working kernel developers and people who would like to be kernel developers, right? who have different needs in, in this regard. So they have a certain set of needs. But then there's user space developers. And they really, really don't care about GFP flags or whatever else, right? They want to know how a particular set of, of system calls work, or what is the interface, or how can I use this fancy IOU ring thing that I've been hearing about, or that sort of stuff, right? That's what they want to know. And so this is a very different need, and they're going to be looking for different stuff. Same with system administrators who perhaps want to know about boot options or module options and syscontrol knobs and things like that that you would use as a system administrator. Distributors have their own needs and users have their own needs. And then, you know, random passers-by just trying to learn something about the kernel each also have their own needs. So we have traditionally in the kernel community responded to these various needs by taking our documentation and putting it in one big, huge pile and saying, grep it out of that. And um, I think that's not very friendly to our users. That's, that's not what we need to be doing if we want our documentation to be useful. So I have been pushing to reorganize things, which um, irritates people. And I have um, been trying to create a set of books to at least bring a little bit of order to the things. So if you look in the documentation directory now, for example, we have a book called the Core API Manual. And so if you want to learn about GFP flags or the spin locks or whatever, you go there. That's where you'll find the documentation for that sort of stuff. Or at least that is the intent. Um, if you're a user space developer, we have a separate manual for you. Stuff that is aimed at user space developers goes in that manual, and you can look there. And you have a whole lot less stuff to search through to find what it is you're interested in yourself. We have a whole directory of, um, of kernel development process manuals. This is one of the most important directories we have, I think. It tells how to be a kernel developer, how to work with us. That's the submitting patches file and the code of conduct and, um, and coding style and all that sort of stuff is all kept in there now. Perhaps I've taken more grief for moving submitting patches into that directory than almost anything else I have done in the, my entire time. Because I, I wrecked everybody's finger memory and they don't know where to find the submitting patches document anymore. And the key use that kernel developers have for submitting patches.txt or .rst now is to tell other kernel developers to read it. And so now they have to figure out where it is again and, and tell them where to find it. But hopefully we've gotten over that. So we've got an admin guide for system administrators. There's a, a, a relatively small set of manuals for our development tools, but hopefully that will grow. But you can see what we're trying to do here. We're trying to create a bit of order and to integrate our manuals so that people can actually find what they want to find. So it's a good start. But I recently ran into a comment. I was talking to Brendan Higgins, who's adding a, a, a unit testing framework to the kernel. And I told him to, to put his documentation in the DevTools directory, because that was where I thought it should be. And he looks at it and says, well, maybe it's premature to bring this up, but documentation DevTools is kind of thrown together. And um, I could get all huffed up and offended, because I created documentation DevTools, but he's totally right. I took a bunch of stuff, and I threw it together and created this as a, as a starting place, to at least have it all in the same place. So what we've done with the creation of these various books to this point 
is we've taken this big pile and we've kind of swept it up into several smaller piles. But haven't really gone beyond that yet to the creation of what I would really think of as a set of manuals. Instead, we've got a, a set of smaller collections of disparate documents that have at least been collected next to the ones that are sort of like them. But those of you who are old timers who think back to the old days when people would print these thick books of the Kernel Documentation Project, and it was just a whole bunch of things that were slapped together, that's what we have. So it would really be nice to not have something that's just thrown together. And we really haven't even begun that task. We're still trying to just figure out how to throw it together before we can do better than that. And while we're on this topic, this is a problem I don't quite know how to deal with, but we've got this nice kernel doc mechanism where we've put the, the documentation with the source code and we can pull them into restructured text files and we build the documents. And this works really great if you're building, say, the HTML documents and you want to read it on kernel.org or whatever, because it brings it all into one place and you can read it together. If you're actually reading the documentation in the source tree, then it's split up. You've got the restructured text documents here, you've got various kernel doc comments over there, and you have to do a lot of jumping around to read it all. And you have to kind of integrate it in your own head. I don't know what we can do to do that better, honestly, but it is an issue that, that comes to mind at times. We have um, some missing manuals, of course. One that we've been talking about for years is the maintainer's guide. We have a lot of documentation on how to be a kernel developer. We don't really have much documentation on how to be a kernel subsystem maintainer. And so you see this sort of ritual where somebody comes in, they start managing a Git repository, and they say, okay, I'm gonna rebase it right now and then send it to Linus. And um, they usually are not happy with what ensues. So we, we really need to document how to be a kernel maintainer because this is, a, something that everybody kind of learns the hard way on their own and pieces together their own procedures and their own tools. We've got, we've got it now, but it only has two manuals in it, including one on why you shouldn't rebase your tree right before you send it to Linus. Um, but we, we need a lot more stuff there. The other thing that is kind of controversial at the moment that we're trying to get into, we don't have it yet, is subsystem guides for developers. It's easy to think of the kernel as being one big project involving thousands of developers. What the kernel project really is, is a hundred or so separate littler projects, all tightly integrated and having to work together in one big building. And I've heard people describe the various subsystems of the kernel as being hundreds of little fiefdoms, right, with each subsystem maintainer managing things in their own particular way. And what happens is that you have different rules for patch submissions, for example, in different parts of the kernel. And so you'll get, say, a highly experienced kernel developer who's worked for years in a specific subsystem, and they find a problem somewhere else in the kernel. And the way we work is that if you find a problem like that, you fix it. You don't try to work around it or whatever. You fix it over there. That's the right thing to do. And so this developer writes up a nice patch and sends it over to that other subsystem maintainer, and they get the subject line wrong or they forget that certain subsystems want their automatic variable declarations in bizarre orderings, or um, anything like that. And then they get flamed for having tried to do the right thing. So people have asked for a while, can we document these, these subsystem specific rules so that you can go and you can see, okay, what are the rules of engagement over there? What do I have to do to send my patch in so that it will be acceptable to the maintainer of that subsystem? So this would be useful, it is controversial, because some people think that we shouldn't have subsystem specific rules, and that documenting them serves to legitimize them, and will create more of these sorts of rules. As everybody says, okay, we document and we can make up whatever rules we want to. Um, That one? Yeah. yeah. Short question. Isn't it then more like a maintainer's guide for developers instead of a subsystem guide? Because, I mean, the whole procedure would probably change if the maintainer changes. Well, it's a guide to the maintainer, though, instead of a guide for the maintainer, perhaps. Yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah it's, you can see it that way. We're documenting people. <laughs> Something like that. Now, when, when this was proposed, and, and the author of this guide, 
put in a section with his own particular subsystem specific rules that included a divergence from the normal coding style. And he got roundly pound on, pounded on for that. Nobody really looked at what he was trying to do, but they were very upset about his, his different coding style rule. And so he looked at it and said, oh yeah, I shouldn't have that. And that, that special rule went out the window. I think that doing this may serve to shine sunlight on weird practices and cause them to go away as much as legitimize them. But not everybody agrees with that. So there have been some arguments about this and I suspect there will be more before we get there. But I raised it at the Maintainer Summit and what Linda said is that we're, we're documenting reality. This is the reality that we have now. And it doesn't go away if you ignore it or sweep it under the carpet. So I think we're gonna have this in one way or another. I intend to, to merge that stuff. Um, tool chain improvements is stuff that I would really like to see. Think about a 2200 line Perl script written by kernel developers in the 1990s um, with half of the lines being regular expressions and you've got the kernel doc script. I really hate to go in there. Um, everybody hates to go in there. Nobody changes this, this, this script unless they really have to. Um, we, we actually have a developer who rewrote it in modern Python and we've just never really had a chance. He hasn't really submitted it and so on, but it might be nice to replace that with something a little bit smarter. Perhaps integrate more of this stuff into Sphinx itself rather than having a separate script. Our PDF generation depends on LaTeX, so if installing Sphinx and building, say, HTML documents is a pretty small set of stuff you have to load on your system. Installing LaTeX to build PDF means bringing this hairy ball of stuff that's bigger than the rest of your distribution combined. <laughs> and um, it's, it's still really fragile and you update your distribution and all of a sudden there's 15 more LaTeX style packages you need to install. And it's, it's really painful. We would really like to do something else. There is a, a restructured text to PDF program out there, but it, it falls to pieces on <laughs> stuff with the complexity of our documentation. We can't use it, but people are starting to work on it again. So I have some hopes that maybe we can dump all of that. But for now, we're stuck with it. Um, our Sphinx style sheets give us output that looks a lot nicer than what we've had before, but I still think it's pretty ugly. If um, Donald Knuth looked at it, he would walk away in disgust. So, um, I would sure love somebody who is into this sort of thing to mess with our style sheets and make something that is typographically a little bit more sensible and easier to read. And the last thing that I have on my list is that we have to um, win over the doubters, of which we have a few. So this was a, a message that was posted a month or two ago um, saying, I hate this stuff, it's pure evil. Um, I've had a few discussions with this particular developer and have actually mostly made peace with him. Um, but you run into this sort of stuff of people who really don't like this whole idea at all. And in fact, the reason that some of our plain text documents have not been converted to restructured text is that there are certain subsystems where nobody dares to try because they will run into fierce resistance from, from the people who live in that particular subsystem. So, We've been slowly overcoming this, but it is a bit of a problem. And we have not yet sold this, this idea of, of using restructured text and bringing more order to our documentation to everybody yet. Um, part of this, I think, is to realize that, you know, you might think, okay, you know, people like this or what they are, let's give them a card punch and let them go off in a corner and do their own thing. But um, in truth, sometimes they have a point. So for example, Restructured text, or Sphinx in particular, has this nifty syntax. If you write in a file a function name like this with this C function thing, it says, this is a C function. Okay, and that does some nice things. It puts it in the, the index of C functions. It will generate a cross-link to the, to the definitive documentation for that function. It does a lot of stuff that you want to have. But um, this is perhaps not the e arg, easiest thing on the eyes, right? And you run into a lot of this stuff in a document. And if you're the sort of person who is morally opposed to the idea of any kind of a markup in a text document to begin with, you're going to look at that and you're going to grumble. And um, so Peter did, and I agree, he's right. So in 5.3, I actually wrote a little extension and added it. So if, you, if it recognizes something that looks like a function invocation, it does that markup itself. And you don't need to add all that other gunk in there. And it makes the documentation work better means we get these links for everyone, not just the ones where people thought to, to annotate them. And you don't have to do all this. It lets you put in patches that looks like, look like this, where you can start to take some of this stuff out again 
and get closer to actual plain text files, that sort of thing. So we need to do a few more things like that to make the, the system less painful for the people who really don't want to engage with it and um, perhaps make it better for all of us in general. It means we move a little bit further away from standard Sphinx and into our own dialect of it, but I think that's just the way it's going to have to be. I don't see that we can avoid that. Uh, we will get something that will, in the end, will work better for the kernel community as a whole. So, and the last thing, of course, is generate more and better documentation. So, um, I'd like to just finish by saying that if you have any interest in participating more in the kernel development community, please consider working on the documentation. There's a lot to do, the maintainer is friendly, and it really, I believe, does a lot to, to help assure a successful future for the kernel as a whole over the long term. So I am done. Looks like I should have a few minutes for questions if people have any. Um. Regarding the integration part, uh, I agree with the problems you, you raised, and I face uh, exactly the same in other projects, uh, mainly another project, which is at your proxy. Uh, what I could propose uh, is to help uh, contributors at least know that uh, the documentation exists and uh, what is relevant to what they are modifying. Because, as you said, there are two sets of files. There is the source code and the documentation. There is no link between each other. And people in good faith will simply ignore that certain documentation are related to what they have modified, and they need to be aware of this. And probably that uh, we should do something like similar to what is done in man, man pages. In man pages, uh, you have C also at the end, and we could have something at the top of the file uh, indicating a list of documents which are really uh, relevant to this file, so that at least contributors in good faith. Could, uh, could visit these files and probably update them as well. Yeah, I mean, cross-linking our documentation in general is you know, something we have the capability to do now. We didn't before. But we're not yet making much use of it. And I agree that would help a lot. And then just reminding people of, of things they could do. I try to do that. And if you get CC'd on every patch that touches documentation, like I do, you see a lot of stuff go by. But there's no way I can keep up with that. So maintainers have to do that in general and take some responsibility for that. Okay. So one comment and two related questions about these. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm still using a Dell Mini 9, so the documentation is not completely out of date. But the question is, so there's a documentation I2C folder. And when I see your restructure, some parts should go to core API and some should go to uh, user, uh, user space API. Do you want? Do you want to get rid of the documentation I2C folder completely and into separate into to the right new directories, or would you prefer to have links, some kind of links? I would like to get rid of as many top-level documentation folders as I can. Okay. So yes, I would like to see documentation I2C go away okay. and and move to you know down a level, just like we don't put all of our source code into one big directory. You know, our documentation had several hundred files in it, and you couldn't find anything. We were slowly shrinking it down. And I would like to get it to a hierarchy that you can actually look at and understand. Okay. So yes, I would like to see things move into the specific manuals. Understood. The second question is you had like links from the documentation folder into like source files, we, because you want to put in the case. How, do you, is there some mechanism to ensure the links don't get stale because file names, files get renamed and stuff? We do run into problems with that. Um, you, of course, you break the, the docs build will immediately scream at you as soon as you've done that. So somebody will catch it right away. And that, that's really the tool that we have. Mm -hmm. We don't really have anything that runs by default when you do a, a kernel build because people get grumpy when you slow down their kernel builds, especially for something boring like documentation. Yeah. Is there something like patch for the documentation entries in the source files, or is check patch uh, checking these documentation entries for validity? Check patch does not. Again, that's the, the checking is done by the kernel doc script. So adding that to check patch, we could maybe add some of that to check patch at some point. Um, I could talk to Joe about that, because, but see, the problem is, well, I mean, it might work, because check patch is already doing an awful lot of parsing of C code. And which is what kernel doc does as well. So 
Maybe that should at some point move, yes. I hadn't really thought about that, but that might be good. I think we had a question back there. Hey, uh, so you were saying that uh, the maintainers of subsystem need to make sure that the documentation relevant to the, their subsystem gets updated. They are in charge of that. So would it be worth like in, uh, in the maintainer's file to have for subsystem have a list of the of the documentation files that are related to this subsystem so that both the people who because when I submit a patch the first thing I do is uh, uh, get maintainer's file it, it would be also useful for me to see oh well actually I didn't know there were all these documentation files related to this subsystem I'm touching might be worth checking yeah, to, and, uh, to an extent we have that some subsystems document their their, um, their documentation files as well in maintainers, others don't. But I mean, there are certainly precedents for that. Those of course tend to go obsolete as soon as people move things around too, but we have a script to find those now. So thanks for the work, first of all. And uh, the, okay, so subsystem specific files are described, but what about a file that describes, uh, so basically what about all the subsystems that do not deviate from the standard some way is there a way like with like a standard file like general uh, subsystem or in guidelines um, I think they would be submitting patches really I mean that's kind of the default understanding we have of how you should submit a patch so so, so if you're subsystems so the expectation is really only subsystems that deviate in any way should be should be documented. yeah although you know there's there's talk of adding a whole lot more than just quaint local customs to this file. So, you know, here's where we have our to-do list of things we would like to do. Um, and a whole lot of other things that, that might be useful to people wanting to contribute to the subsystem, not just patch contribution rules. So there, there's more use for that than just that. Thank you for the excellent presentation. Uh, um, what are your thoughts on uh, binary files, like images and diagrams in the documentation directory? I think there are very few of them, and I, if I recall correctly, there was a resistance from some people to add them, and in general, I think the fault still feels that documentation is supposed to be for text, but in a lot of cases, like diagrams and visuals, they help a lot, so that's kind of was one of the reasons, for example, for BPF documentation, there is gigantic, like, multi-multi-page stuff on Cilium.io that Daniel maintains, so he wrote a ton of it, and it's not part of the documentation, because, like, without diagrams, it's not really, like, practical. And another example, on the GitHub, we have a repo of all the PDFs and all the slides that people ever presented, and we just, like, dumped them there. And we thought it would be just a collection of stuff, but then eventually people started like referring to this PDF and presentation from the past and we found it useful. But on the kernel tree, I think Linus himself was like not happy to see that stuff that is just like a binary blob inside the GitHub. So uh, what's your take on it? Like how we can... Yeah, this is something we have discussed over the years. And I, for diagrams, th there is a way to do it with, with graph viz and that sort of thing. For, for some things, that's not gonna work for everything. Um, we do have some stuff, and it was kind of agreed that the SVG is a, is a reasonable format to add certain kinds of, of diagrams into the documentation tree. You know, it's not plain text, but it kind of looks like text. You can read it in the text editor, um, you know, Git understands it. So, you know, if you want to add something, that's the least resistance path is to add it as a, as a scalable vector graphics file. Um, you know, other stuff we can take on a case-by-case -case basis. I think if we start trying to add lots of slide decks and so on to the kernel tree, that that we're going to start running into resistance because we're going to add, you know, be adding a large amount of stuff to just kind of lug around that we're not editing and we're not working on, and that perhaps there should be a separate repository outside the kernel tree for for some of that sort of stuff. That that would be my own impression on that. I would like to say uh, uh, what you did with uh, implicit tagging in uh, 5.3 is very, very important, in fact. There are lots of people like me who are uh, very difficult at learning uh, new languages or temporarily learning a new language. Uh, 
and uh, for people like me, it's very difficult, and uh, usually we give up. And on HA proxy, when people uh, refuse to contribute some documentation, I say it's, uh, there is not no possible trade-off. If there is a code, you need to publish at least some user documentation on the feature. And when they tell me I don't know the format, I tell them if it looks good on screen, that's what that's fine. And uh, I don't impose any format because they don't have to e install tools or whatever. If it look, look, looks good on screen, it's good already. And uh, I'm seeing this being done right now, and that's really good. Yeah, then we, we want it to be as simple as possible, for sure. Right behind you. Hi. Um, so there has been work done to convert the device tree bindings to a YAML format. Are there plans to integrate that into the documentation? There aren't really. I, I've had a couple of talks with some of the device tree people, but nothing has really proceeded on that. Um, Would you like to see something like that happen? I, if it's useful to the people who use those bindings, then yeah, um, we could do that. Assuming, of course, that the device tree people don't follow through on their long-term threat and move that stuff out of the kernel entirely. But um, I haven't seen any movement on that. So if it's there and, and the documentation, it would be useful as documentation, that format, then yes, we should, we should deal with it appropriately. Uh, over there. Nice to us. Yeah. Uh, how do you see the articulation between the user space-oriented documentation in the kernel and the man pages project? Because there's a lot of overlap, like versus procfs, stuff like that. There is a lot of overlap, and for a lot of user space documentation, the Man Pages project is the right place for it. Um, one might argue that all of it is, I don't know. But we have a fair amount of it, and as long as we have it, I think we should have it properly accessible. And, you know, if you start getting into stuff like the format of ring buffers or whatever, you know, maybe we should have some of that stuff in the kernel tree as well. Anybody else? If not, then I guess maybe it's break time. Thank you.